All right, so we were saying the interpretation of gravitational energy is it tells you how much work it takes to get from the ground to where you are. And we were seeing that a joule could also be interpreted as a Newton meter. <coughs> object went from here to here. Well, the, poten the potential energy here would be something like, I don't know, maybe 8 joules. What does that mean? Well, it means that to go from the ground to here would take 8 joules of work. But let's say we go from here to here. What would delta U be when we go from here to here? A pardon? Two joules? Yeah, positive two joules, because mm -hmm. we'd be moving up. What does that, what's the significance of that? It would take two joules of energy to move from that distance to that region. Yeah, it would take two joules of work to move the object from here to here. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out that in most contexts, what we really care about is not the energy, but the change in energy between two positions. Mm -hmm. Because the change in energy between two positions tells you how much work it took to move the object between those two positions. Now we're focusing on gravitational energy here, but we're going to see the same exact things in a second for electrical potential energy. The change in the electrical potential energy when you move a charge tells you how much work it would take to move the charge between those two points. One thing to keep in mind is that it's actually arbitrary what we choose to define as the ground. If we wanted to, we could have defined this as the ground. We could have said that this is u equals zero, and then the u over here would be two joules because it's two um, units above the ground. And then the u over here would be negative six joules. It's a little bit uncommon to you have negative energies when you're dealing with gravity, but there wouldn't be anything paradoxical to that. And so notice, where do particles prefer to be? Do they prefer to have positive, zero, or negative energies? Where would a particle prefer to be at two joules of energy, zero joules of energy, or negative six? Right, because everything wants to lower its energy, which means moving to the left on the number line. Moving to the left. So again, there's nothing, nothing paradoxical about a negative energy. That just means the particle is really happy. Yeah. Uh, they like having negative energies, because that means they're far to the left on the number line, and everything wants to lower its energy. And the reason we're talking about this is, usually when you're doing gravity, you define the ground so you'll never be below the ground, so you don't end up with negative energies. But we oftentimes do get negative energies when we're dealing with electric forces. And there's nothing paradoxical about that. Um, and negative energy just means the particle is happier than it would be if it had zero energy. And zero energy means you're happier than you would be if you had a positive energy. One other concept that's useful is height. Um, so, do particles try to increase their height or decrease their height? Um, they try to decrease their height? Yeah, they try to decrease their height. Mm -hmm. So, when something is high, it's unhappy. I guess uh, particles have a fear of heights, we mm -hmm. could say. Every, again, if I release the particle from here, it would try to go lower, not higher. So, everything tries to decrease its height. Or maybe one more concept, how about depth then? Does the particle try to increase or decrease its depth? You can think of depth as lowness, basically. Okay, then I guess decrease. I mean, increase. Yeah, depth. maybe that's yeah. a little bit weird to think about. Yeah. But you try to get to greater depths. So again, uh, for example, if I release a particle from over here, um, well, would it rather go to here or to here? Would it rather go all the way down here? Because this is a greater depth or a greater lowness. Maybe lowness is more intuitive than, than depth. Well, let's think about the concept of electrical potential energy. Now, we're going to keep using the symbol U for electrical potential energy, because U stands for potential energy. Usually, you won't have gravity and electric force in the same problem, so there won't be any, uh, any ambiguity. What would be a good unit for electrical potential energy? Um, joules, I would think. Yeah, yeah, because it's energy. Yeah. Just like all forces are in Newtons, all energies are in joules. Mm -hmm. Remember, we were just reviewing a second ago that a joule is a newton meter, force times distance. Remember, remember that both work and energy can be measured in joules or newton meters. 
Do you remember from last term, is energy a vector or a scalar? Energy is a vector. Actually a scalar. Energy is a scalar. Okay. That just has to be memorized as part okay. of the definition. You would talk about 8 newtons north, but you would never talk about 8 joules north. We never used directions when we were talking about energy. One reason you might have gotten confused there is oh, yeah. energy does, can have a sign. We were just saying that energy could be positive or negative, mm -hmm. but just because something can be negative doesn't mean it's a vector. Some scalars can be, can be negative as well. So this is a scalar that could be positive or negative, yeah. um, but it doesn't have a direction. So this is a scalar. Why am I making such a big deal about that? Well, are we ever going to have to break energy into components? No, so it's important to know that because we need to know what things we have to break into components and what we don't. That actually will make our life a lot easier, but we don't have to break this into components. Um, so let's figure out the energy between two point charges. Well, that turns out to be K, Q1, Q2 over R. This tells us the energy between two point charges. This should remind you of the formula for the force. Between two point charges. It's the same formula, except this is based on R, and this is based on R squared. Uh, there's another important difference. Remember that when we wrote down this formula, we wrote down all these variables with dots to remind ourselves that we're just using this formula to figure out magnitudes. So we're not going to put in any negative signs over here for force. But I didn't put any dots over here because you should, you should put in the signs of these charges. That's a good thing to note in your notes. When we use this formula, we're not putting in the signs of the charges. But when we use this formula, we are putting in the signs of the charges. Remember, we said a second ago that it's perfectly possible that energy could be negative or positive. Now, let's say, uh, what does R represent? R represents the distance between the charges. By the way, as you might expect, this also works if you have spherically symmetric distributions of charges, and then R would be the distance between their centers. So what would U be when R is infinite? Suppose the two charges are an infinite distance from each other. What would U be? Yeah, good. You put in infinity on the bottom here. This comes out to be zero. What that means is that we're defining a infinity as the zero point. Remember that when we're working with gravitational energy, we usually define the ground as the zero point for energy. But there's no special meaning to the ground when you're working with electrical forces. Gravity doesn't come from the earth or from the ground. So it, uh, a better reference point to use is infinity. When objects, when charges are infinitely separated from each other, when point charges are infinitely separated from each other, their potential energy is zero. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to have a different um, reference point for the ground, so to speak. The zero point for point charges is when u is zero. But um, in some contexts, you might use different formulas, and then you would have a, a different zero point. You, it's arbitrary what we pick as the zero point. But if we're working with this formula, we're assuming that the zero point is infinity. say about the gravitational analogy. Remember, let's say this, point, this object here has six joules of gravitational energy. Remember, we can interpret that as saying that it takes six joules of work to move from here to here. Now, there's another way to interpret that. Let's say that we let this object fall down to the ground. Well, if the object falls down to the ground, it's going to lose this potential energy. Mm -hmm. So how much kinetic energy will the object have when it reaches the ground? Um, six joules? Yeah. And then how can we figure out how fast it's going to be going when it hits the ground? That's right. If you remember the formula that the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, mm -hmm. 
If we know the object's mass, and we know that at the ground it's going to have six joules of energy, we could then solve for V. And this is a common type of problem uh, that we'll be doing with electric forces. So there's two ways to interpret this. One way is that if we move if we move the object where it doesn't want to go, it will take six joules of work. But another interpretation is that if we let it reverse that path, well, then it's going where it wants to go. So it's going to be speeding up. And then you, how do you figure out how fast it's going at the end by using this? And you'll have to do a bunch of problems like this probably in, in this week's homework and on the exam for electric forces. Mm -hmm.